Welcome to Under the Dome. My name is Emily Brewer and I'll be your host for today's program. Under the Dome is Town Meeting TV's coverage of the Vermont Legislative Session. In this series, we speak with legislators and advocates about the bills that move through the legislature this year and what they might need, mean for you and your neighbors. On today's program, we've got two representatives from Winooski. We're joined by Daisy Berbeco and Taylor Small. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, or today. I'm, I'm uh, aging myself here, but <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and um, so Daisy, you serve on the Committee of Healthcare, on healthcare, excuse me, while Taylor serves on the Committee on Human Services. Starting with Daisy, could you tell us a little bit about um, a couple of the things you worked on on the Healthcare Committee this year? Thanks so much for coming to Winooski today. Welcome. It's a great spot. <laughs> um, so I was so pleased and fortunate to land on the Committee on Healthcare in the legislature and had a wonderful time working with my colleagues there um, and are the great leadership of Lori Houghton from Essex. Um, I think there were three key things that I'm proud to have um, collaborated on in that committee. Um, number one was um, legislation around reproductive rights and access to gender affirming health care. Um, that legislation, um, many of you have, have heard of CHIELD laws. Um, so there was a House bill and also a Senate companion to that. Um, I'm incredibly proud to support um, protecting our providers in delivering uh, access to those legally, um, um, legally protected health care services so that everyone in Vermont can continue to have bodily autonomy and access to reproductive health care. Um, the other legislation is um, the suicide prevention bill um, that um, um, reduced access to lethal means. Um, Alyssa Black was such a great leader in really pioneering um, a voice behind why we need legislation like that. And as someone who's worked in the field of suicide prevention and mental health advocacy for decades, I, um, I just can't speak highly enough of, of all of the voices that um, bravely <laughs> came in and, and helped move the, moved the bill over the finish line. So um, that one, um, I know we're going to probably hear a bit about um, when it comes to the governor, just in terms of whether it's constitutional or not. And I'm happy to um, have the support of our attorney general on that and, and look forward to um, further discussion on it. And lastly, I think something that um, we all need is better access to health care services in Vermont. So the health care committee took up four different pieces of legislation that would um, have Vermont providers um, joining um, interstate compacts that would allow providers in Vermont who are licensed here to provide services um, to other states that are part of a compact. So that allows um, providers here to not only provide services out of state, um, but also allows patients in Vermont or residents here to also get services from other providers who are part of the compact. I think those are probably six key pieces of legislation that were really grueling to do work on. But um, again, my committee was just incredible and I'm really proud to be part of those. Thank you, Daisy. And it sounds like really important work that needed to be done. So despite the fact that it was grueling, thank you for, for working on that. And Taylor, um, moving on to, um, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you did in the Human Services Committee? Absolutely. And what a beautiful day here in Winooski. <laughs> um, you know, our, our work really starts first on the budget. That's where a lot of our human services work is because of understanding the funding needs for the various programs uh, serving Vermont's most vulnerable people across the state. And uh, one piece I will highlight amongst all of the investments that we made was really increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates for various providers, especially looking to our older Vermonters for adult day beds or nursing home beds, um, understanding that there is this intersection with homelessness as well as older Vermonters not necessarily getting the services that they need. So by increasing those Medicaid reimbursements, being able to expand services available. A smaller yet, I still think a very important win as well, was getting a, a vehicle for our youth development program. 
And this vehicle would allow for foster youth who are having a difficult time staying in driver's education, um, either because they're bouncing around from different schools or aren't able to stay in a consistent program, uh, to be able to now have one vehicle that goes around the state to be able to provide driver's ed um, and a collaboration already set in place with driver's ed instructors to be able to get, um, I think it's about 76% of our foster youth do not attain their license uh, by the age of 18, and this would allow them to do so. But I think uh, just to talk about the major legislation, of course, I cannot overlook uh, our amazing child care bill that we did this year, really expanding access for uh, folks across the state of Vermont, in particular looking to rural Vermont uh, for our family child care homes and increasing reimbursements for them as well as understanding that for financial assistance for families who are paying way too much to be able to keep their kids in uh, sustainable child care, especially to have it all week instead of these kind of uh, piece and parcel uh, child care situations. We were able to go all the way up to 550% of the federal poverty level of folks who would qualify and actually removed uh, the copay for families under 175% of the federal poverty level. And lastly, I will mention our work on overdose prevention. Uh, one key bill that we were able to pass is 222, uh, which really expanded access to naloxone. Do we want to pause? <laughs> Hello, friend. <laughs> oh, so cute. Um, so, no worries, an adorable interruption. Um, but really taking smaller steps to address the overdose crisis, um, especially accessing naloxone and buprenorphine and removing the sunset that was previously put forward by the administration to make sure that personal use amounts of buprenorphine would not be criminalized anymore. Thank you very much, Taylor. And again, really important work being done on all sides here. And so something about this legislative session was that um, the Democratic Party had a veto-proof majority. And now Daisy as a Democrat and um, Taylor as a progressive Democrat, did this veto-proof majority change the way that you approach legislating at all? And we'll start with Daisy again. I'm trying really hard not to say that's a good question because I feel like that <laughs> statement is so <laughs> overused. <laughs> but it really is because um, as a first-time legislator, I don't really have a comparison for that. Yes. So did it change what I have done differently? I, I don't have a comparison <laughs> for you. Um, no, I mean, I, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, I the way that I vote is by my conscience and by what I know Winooski and, and our constituents here um, have, have voiced as their needs and concerns and priorities. Um, and then I use a lot of the resources that, um, you know, my colleagues and across the party and, and even outside the party. I mean, there are tons of things I've collaborated on with Taylor. She referenced some of the opioid legislation. Um, she and I co-sponsored her legislation on that and she's co-sponsored legislation that I led. And so I think, um, you know, the, having the supermajority is an opportunity to, um, for some maybe, but I think a lot of us really, um, you know, what guides us is those principles and values. And, and so I think other people might, I don't know, I'm curious what Taylor would say in terms of someone who has something to compare it to. But for me, those are the principles that, that sort of guide, you know, where I go. And, and I think right now what we're seeing is something that is more of a numbers game. And so maybe that's what you're referring to, Taylor. <laughs> Yeah, um, I really appreciate the question because of the piece of thinking about how I legislate in relation to a supermajority. And I would say it hasn't changed the way I'm working in that building and how we're doing that work together. What I think changes the conversation in the building is... Uh, about that veto-proof number, especially when we take uh, progressives and Democrats together into one larger swath. And understanding that for minority parties, typically they describe it as being on a ship together. And that the, the majority party is the one that is steering the ship and showing us the direction of where we're going. And the minority parties are there to point out any of the pitfalls, any of the rocks, the icebergs that are ahead to make sure that we're having well-rounded legislation. And I think that's what comes with a stronger responsibility with a supermajority 
priority is to make sure that we are bringing our minority parties into the mix and hearing the different perspectives instead of brushing it off with the, oh, well, we can pass it anyway, which luckily I would say is not the experience that I had in the uh, legislature this year. I think what was disappointing, I would say, is that it seemed that with the lower numbers of our Republican colleagues in the House in particular, um, they weren't as active to voice uh, their opinions or perspectives through the process as we were doing legislation um, because they saw the supermajority as a barrier to that work. Uh, so that would be my only, I know it's a weird thing to say that the uh, my uh, downfall of the supermajority is not having uh, diverse perspectives maybe as loud as they usually are, but I really truly find the diverse opinions help us to pass legislation that is more balanced uh, in the long run. Thank you, Taylor, and I really enjoyed that uh, ship metaphor. I think that really helps visualize it a little bit because um, from the outside, it's hard to know sort of the inner workings and what you're thinking about when you're when you're in there making votes and choices. So. Um, before I move on to my next question, I just kind of want to go back to um, Daisy and was there anything else you would like to add about what you, how you felt, what you thought being a first time legislator, legislator um, this session? Hmm. I had a lot of thoughts and feelings. <laughs> yes, I bet. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, one fundamental takeaway is just I feel extreme you know gratitude to be in the legislature first of all um, and representing a place as unique and special as Winooski and the opportunity to work alongside Taylor who's a national leader um, is incredible really um, the other thing is the the incredible gratitude I feel to be professionally coming full circle, it feels like, um, having worked um, in advocacy for mental health and substance misuse, and then um, having worked alongside providers um, to help sustain business operations, and, um, and then coming to state policy after being at the Agency of Human Services. Um, it really feels like a big click. Um, and I feel like I have um, found a place where all of that experience is really informing great policy. And I feel like I have the colleagues who value that. And it's, it's really an extraordinary feeling. Well, thank you for that takeaway. I, thank you for sharing. And um, We'll move on now to sort of the big question that's on a lot of people's minds, which uh, has to do with emergency housing. On the last day of the session, the legislature passed the budget, but that budget does not include support for the continuation of the emergency housing program established during the pandemic, Pandemic, excuse me, meaning that over 2,000 Vermonters uh, will be evicted from motels across the state this summer. That budget vote did not have a veto-proof majority, and it sounds like the governor will not support it. So that being said, what do you think is the path forward for the budget? And uh, how do you think the state should support those people that are currently being housed in motels? And we can start with Taylor for this one. Yeah, a very, a very big question. And I will just start off in acknowledging that I was one of the, the no votes on the budget because of this particular issue. And uh, being in human services, this is right in our wheelhouse of work that we were doing throughout the session, especially hearing directly from uh, providers at sh emergency shelters across the state, as well as folks experiencing homelessness and trying to get a full understanding of, of what the picture is and the reality here in the state of Vermont. And what came across really clearly uh, from those conversations is that homelessness in Vermont has always been a policy choice. Um, prior to the pandemic, the legislature administration has been relatively comfortable with about 1,100 households being houseless uh, in the state of Vermont as it fluctuates throughout the year. And so I think what has brought this conversation to light is the fact that during the pandemic, we were able to house everyone experiencing homelessness. We took a very bold and important step in protecting everyone and making sure that they had a roof over their heads. 
And now as we're seeing the transition of this program, and I really want to highlight the nuance there of the transition, that the general assistance emergency housing program is not disappearing by any means. Uh, just the rules of who is able to participate and to what extent are changing back to their pre-pandemic rules. And so those were really limiting. Uh, the rules prior to the pandemic uh, limited uh, folks who are pregnant and who would be able to participate. You would only be able to uh, get a hotel room if you were in your third trimester. Or if we think about families with children, it would only count if you had children under the age of five. But if you had children over the age of five, you still would not uh, necessarily qualify for general assistance emergency housing. So that's why we're seeing such a mass exodus happening, um, both at the end of this month and then a, a larger group of folks at the end of uh, June. And so what I see as a path forward is really trying to figure out um, if there is flexibility in the budget that we passed with cooperation from the administration and the Agency of Human Services to make sure that there is a just transition for these folks instead of this abrupt end and pushing folks uh, and putting the responsibility onto our municipalities. I think uh, one thing that became really clear through testimony and through conversations with AHS is that the typical exit rate for this program is about 100 to 200 households a month. And so to be exiting over 1,000 households or exiting over 700 households in one month is not uh, doing due justice for our communities and being able to support and understand the larger swath of an impact that we'll have. I think otherwise, if we're not able to come to an agreement or cooperation between uh, the budget that was put forward and the administration, then we need to rewrite the budget. And we're talking about a nearly eight and a half billion dollar budget. Um, and the investment that we're looking for for a just transition is just 0.3% of that budget to be able to allow for folks to not be put out onto the street and to have a, a shelter over their head. So. It's not, it's not a fun solution by any means. It is really complicated, but I think that it, it comes with the territory of this work is to make those really tough decisions. Thank you. And Daisy, anything you'd like to add? I agree with Taylor that it is a really complicated decision. Um, and it does seem really abrupt to me and, um, and tragic, um, but it didn't have to be abrupt. That's the thing is the administration has been asking for a transition plan or sorry, the legislature has been asking for a transition plan from the administration for years. And I know that because I worked at AHS during the time that this program was stood up and Taylor has been working in house or er, human services um, and was part of trying to get that transition plan in place. So we both voted for the budget adjustment um, in March, which gave an additional $65 million to help the administration transition this population. And maybe that's what Taylor's referring to, that it should be more gradual, 100 people per month or something that's a little more realistic in terms of you know, connecting folks to services and more permanent housing. Um, so it should never be this abrupt. Um, and I think we are all equally frustrated um, but I think that um, there are a lot of us who have different, um, different approaches going forward. So I think that what needs to happen is we need to pass this budget. I think this is not a single issue budget. I think there are things baked into this that actually support these people. I think we have um, $211 million for housing in this budget. We have over, I think the governor's budget had what, $56 million in it for housing and the House and Senate agreed through the conference committee, $211 million for housing. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the governor say that we are spending so much money, we're putting it into housing and this is a problem that the administration should have addressed years ago when the legislature was asking them to transition this population. So I think what you're seeing is a legislature that is ready to go we have, as Taylor and I walked through, put forward legislation that addresses social determinants of health for Vermonters through addressing things like the opioid epidemic, through raising Medicare rates, Medicaid rates to providers across the board, including dentists, mental health care providers, primary care providers. Um, and we are really addressing social determinants of health and housing is at the center of that. I don't think there's anyone in the legislature who didn't learn that this past session. We've done such a good job collaborating on that. Um, and I think it's really unfortunate that at the end of the session, 
um, this project that the administration has clearly dragged their toes on and failed on is dragging us down because we've done great work together. And I think we're gonna to continue to do great work together. Thank you, Daisy, and thank you, Taylor, as well, um, for both shedding some light on this very pressing issue. And we'll be following this as, um, as, as I believe the session, the next is in June, um, voting on that budget. Um, so we'll be speaking with legislators and keeping folks up to date on um, what's going on with this issue as, as, as well as others. And so that being said, uh, let's shift now to a more local focus. I'm very curious um, to know what the impact will be um, of this le legislative session on um, folks living in Winooski. And Daisy, we can start with you. I think there's a lot. I mean, I mentioned social determinants of health just now. So my mind is there in terms of health care, um, child care also. Taylor worked a lot on that bill. And I know as a parent, that one is top of my heart and mind. I have two little kids that were greatly impacted um, by everything that this new child care legislation will partly address. Um, and so I'm probably most excited about um, 217. And I think, um, that will probably, for me, impact a lot of, or from what I know of constituents in Winooski, that will be a, a huge one. Um, again, I think for some of our um, older Vermonters and older folks in Winooski, I think some of the you know, improved Medicaid rates for providers is going to start to address some of the, the pains that we all have had in healthcare recently. Um, a lot of folks who get Medicaid um, or who are, getting services from Medicaid are going to start to hopefully see that we are beginning to chip away at some of those some of those areas. Yeah, and really to build on it and to talk about housing, I think S100 really is going to have a significant impact here in Winooski. Um, we've already been a model city when it comes to development and making sure that we can get more and more housing built as, as fast as possible, but also in a sustainable and environmentally conscious way. And I think what uh, the state was able to do by removing some of these impediments around Act 250 and expanding the allowable development, even right here within Winooski, is just going to help address the housing crisis that we have heard time and time and time again. On top of investments in, uh, of $60 million into the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, on top of uh, additional investments that we made during the Budget Adjustment Act, I think that shows this legislature's commitment to really addressing the housing crisis. The other piece I will acknowledge is that um, we are looking to welcome more refugees here into the state of Vermont, and we invested a million dollars into employment supports for uh, refugees and new Americans and getting connected to employment, um, and are also looking into housing options there as well. Uh, too many of our refugee and new American families are still um, in hotels themselves, not through the general assistance program, but very much adjacent in recognizing exactly that, that we are welcoming folks, we have always been welcoming folks here in Vermont, um, but we also need the housing to support the folks that we're bringing in. And I think what is really important about welcoming uh, more refugees into the state of Vermont is that it comes with it federal funding to really upstand and expand the services that we're able to provide. I was sad to see that in the budget uh, conference there was a, a needs assessment that was put in on the House side and really understanding what services do we have available and where do we need more, especially as we're seeing folks move into different uh, parts of the state who might not have those services uh, there already. And so I'm hoping, again, flexibility in the budget that we are still able to do that needs assessment so then we can even better understand where we can uplift communities like Winooski that are doing the work, um, but also make making sure that the state is putting that funding behind it as well. Well, thank you, Taylor. And so you both have done some really hard, important work this session, but I'm both of you had your own priorities coming into the session. Were there any that either weren't addressed, were left on the wall? Um, if you could just speak to that. You know, I think I was most disappointed to not see Just Cause Eviction advance this year. And I know that um, it will be taken up next year, but I think that was an especially hard one. Um, just knowing how overwhelmingly voters in Winooski supported that, it was hard to see that one not advance. 
I absolutely second that one and really welcome the chance for us to get a statewide policy in place so it isn't dependent on where you live in the state um, and having those tenant rights and protections. One piece I will highlight uh, that didn't make crossover, but I'm really excited that will be coming up for consideration next year, are overdose prevention centers. So H72, which was passed out of Human Services and Ways and Means in the House and is currently sitting in appropriations, uh, co-sponsored by my uh, seatmate here. And uh, what this is really looking at is our work that we tried to do in the last biennium, which was study overdose prevention centers and the impact that they could have in Vermont, a rural state where we have not uh, seen in the United States a rural application of this, but we have seen it in other nations such as Canada. And so, um, what we are looking at is no longer studying this. We've looked at the research, we've looked at the international research, we've looked at the research right here in the United States, and it says that not only is Vermont leading in overdose deaths in the nation right now, but we need a new solution. This is, of course, not the panacea of addressing the opioid crisis in Vermont, but it is addressing the death crisis, the overdose death crisis that we're seeing here. And so I look forward to that uh, continuing its conversation in the next uh, year. Awesome. Thank you, Taylor. And finally, before we wrap up here, I want to give you guys uh, a chance to uh, let your constituents know who are watching out there how they can get in touch with you, um, particularly at this point in the legislative session, but in general. I know uh, in our emails you mentioned a coffee hour, um, so if either of you just want to uh, let folks know, that would be fantastic. Thanks again for coming to Winooski and, and having us. Um, best place to get in touch with me is I have a website, www.daisyforwinooski.com. Um, go to my blog. I just posted a blog update today. I'll be doing a session, end of session report. Today there's a new post on the money. Um, the budget's important, so I did a post um, on our budget, the capital bill, and an update from the Ways and Means Committee. I also will be doing a coffee hour with our Senator Martine Gulick, and that is on the 14th at the Senior Center. I believe it's at 10 a.m., and I'll put that on my website as well. And as always, available uh, via my website, taylorsmallvt.com, or across social media, which is just the same handle, taylorsmallvt. Um, have not planned on the coffee hours yet, as I am very much embracing this nice little break at the end of the session. Um, but yes, always welcome continued conversations with folks in community. Well, thank you. Thank you both. That break is well deserved for both of you. And um, thanks for having us here in Winooski. We're glad to join you uh, in this wonderful behind the uh, Winooski Memorial Library. And yeah, thank you for tuning in and watching Under the Dome. Stay tuned in the coming weeks as we continue to recap uh, the 2023 legislative session. You can watch online at uh, www.ch17.tv or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash townmeetingtv. Thank you very much for watching and have a great rest of your day.